want to acknowledge the original land stewards. Okay. This is the land steward program. And wherever we are, we are on native lands where for this class, I just want to mention that the native plants have a deep and ancient reciprocal relationship with the native people of those lands. Here at Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center, we are on the traditional lands of the Tequilma people who were forcibly removed and to whom we owe an unpaid debt of land, culture, and history. If you want to explore more about native lands where you are, you can go to this map. This is a fun one, just at nativeland.ca. So we'll be recording this presentation and registrants for the class will receive a link within a day or two of the recording. And if you want to put on closed caption, you can just look in your Zoom controls and hit that CC uh, icon there. So this program is brought to you by the OSU Land Steward Program Community Education Series out of Jackson County, Oregon. I know we have people that reach us now from all over the place. I am the coordinator of the program. I'm Rachel Whirling, and I'm easy to find. If you just Google my name, you can get my email. Marcy Kamiker is with us tonight, too. She's our education committee chair, and if anything goes wrong with the technology and for some reason I disappear, she would just take the reins, and you would know what was happening there. Uh, we have a, three, a very simple three-question um, poll at the end, and if you hang out for a moment, I'll launch that once we're close to the end and done with our questions. If you want to sign up for our um, email list that, to hear of upcoming classes and events, just go to search OSU Land Steward Program, go to our landing page, and click that little check mark, and you'll get a sign-up sheet. We only send upcoming classes announcements there. Nothing else comes across. Uh, so you would hear about things like this. This is what we have coming up now. Um, propagating native plants from seed is tonight. Um, Burn Piles Biochar and Fire Ecology is a partner. Uh, that's putting that one on, November 19th. Then um, our program on December 13th has managing cultural resources on your property. So if you have land and have ever found anything old, we're going to have some archaeologists um, on hand to talk about uh, what that means and what to do and those kinds of things. And then January 23rd, we have a panel of local folks talking about how they launched a neighborhood climate club and uh, kind of gives ideas about organizing your community around uh, topics that are of importance to you. And then I did want to mention also November 18th is uh, Lynn Kuntzman from the, our Master Gardener program will be offering a class on stratifying native seeds. So that could be, I'm sure Susie will talk about that a little bit, but um, if you want to go deeper, there's another offering coming up. Okay, so that brings me to the opportunity to present Susie Savoy. Uh, she's a very wonderful local botanist, former uh, um, conservation chair for our chap Susie chapter of the Native Plant Society and does lots of things. Watch for her name in the community. She is the co-owner of the Siskiyou Ecological Services and Klamath Siskiyou Native Seeds. She provides native seed collection services, native nursery plants, online sales of native seed packets, native plant consultation, and planting plans. Susie is an avid hiker, backpacker, gardener, native plant enthusiast, and off-grid homesteader. For 20 years, she has been using native plants for gardens and habitat restoration on her property in the Applegate Valley, and she enjoys helping others do the same. So I welcome Susie. So happy to have you here and so glad there's so much interest. And I'll turn over the screen share to you. Thank you. Okay, let's get started here. Let's see, share that. Okay, does that look good, Rachel? Looks good. Excellent. Okay. So I'll right. just go into the background here. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming to today's presentation, Growing Native Plants from Seed. I want to thank the OSU Land Stewards Program for hosting today's presentation. I appreciate the invitation, and I'm happy to be here today as uh, native plant seeds are one of my life's biggest passions, so I have lots to say on the topic. Um, as mentioned, I run Climate Siskiyou Native Seeds based out of my remote off-grid homestead in the Upper Applegate Valley. I provide native seed packet sales online. I do native seed collection contracting, grow native potted plants, and do a lot of native planting and seeding project consultation and um, do some large projects. Um, this is the website. It's easy to remember, climasiskiuseeds.com. I'll be showing this again at the very end, so you'll have a chance to write it down if you don't get it now. Um, you can buy native plant, uh, native seed packets online through our online shopping cart, like you see in the upper right-hand corner there. This is the beautiful mule's ears here. Um, these are the seeds of mule's ears. They look a little bit like sunflower seeds, and that's because the mule's ears are in the same plant family, the aster or sunflower family. 
Um, I also run a small native plant nursery. Uh, you can purchase plants directly from us or at the um, native plant sales in Phoenix put on by Pollinator Project Rogue Valley, where we have um, a booth with our plants. Um, so you can see I've always got lots going on and a lot of times it um, involves native plants. Um, these are photos of some of the other ways that I'm involved in native plants in the region. There's many different ways that native seeds and the plants that are propagated from them fit into our local communities and local landscapes. And learning how to grow native plants from seeds is foundational for increasing the availability of native plants for rural habitat restoration, as well as urban landscaping. So I'm not gonna go into all the reasons why growing native plants is a good thing to do beyond just a quick mention uh, that growing native plants increases biodiversity, which is good for pollinators, wildlife, humans, and the planet as a whole. Um, this presentation is more of a how-to presentation and most of you are probably on this Zoom because you already understand the benefits of growing native plants. So I will just dive into the details about how to grow native plants from seeds. So how it all starts for me is that I go on hikes, backpacking trips, and drive around remote backcountry roads to look for and collect native seeds. I have commercial seed collecting permits for both Forest Service and BLM lands in the region. The Klamasuski region is renowned for its world-class biodiversity with thousands of species of native plants, including many rare and endemic species. And although over my years of working with native plants, I've probably only worked with around 300 or so of those, you know, thousands of species, the idea is that um, the work that I do will provide many people an easy opportunity to start learning and identifying some of our great native species um, and enjoy learning and observing how pollinators and birds use them in gardens as well. And that will lead to a better understanding of native plants and desire to help conserve them in the wild, as well as grow them in gardens, landscapes, and habitat restoration projects. Um, when you're out collecting seeds, you really start to get to know the plants more intimately and learn about how they grow, starting with seeds. Um, I'll show you some slides of different species and what their seeds look like, just to kind of get the ball rolling here um, and have you, you know, see that there's so many different sizes and you know, they come in all sorts of different shapes, sizes, colors. Um, so this is deltoid balsam root on the top, another plant in the sunflower family um, that has just sunflower uh, seed-like seeds. And then Washington lily, um, has those kind of paper thin round seeds. Soap root is a night blooming flower um, on the top, uh, grows from a large bulb um, that can be pounded into a soap. Uh, you see this species in portions of the Applegate, Grants Pass, Illinois Valley towards the coast. Um, so it has little black seeds. And bluehead gilia, this is an example of a capsule. So inside those, uh, the pitcher there, those capsules, um, there's a bunch of little seeds inside the capsule. And that species, bluehead gilia or just blue gilia, um, it can have big blooms after wildfire, especially. Oregon checker mallow has small crescent shaped seeds and Western wallflower, <clears throat> which is in the mustard plant family, has little reddish brown seeds. And this set of photos depicts um, Douglas aster and Biglow sneezeweed seed heads just at the point when the seeds are releasing from the plant. Uh, this is the perfect time to collect seeds like this when they're fully mature and are easily to, easy to collect. Um, many of you will just buy native seeds for growing native plants, but I want to cover seed collection for those of you that are interested in that aspect, as you can't grow native plants without native seeds for the most part, um, besides root divisions, cuttings, and other clonal propagation techniques. Um, although clonal propagation can produ produce a lot of plants, um, you, you get more genetic diversity when you grow plants from seeds. Um, so that's something to keep in mind because genetic diversity is important. Um, basically, there's no rules or um, for collecting seeds on private land beyond not collecting seeds of endangered species. I collect a lot of seeds from my own 32 acres, but I use, uh, while I do that, I use a lot of seed increase techniques to keep growing and increasing the populations of native plants on my property as well to keep rejuvenating what I take. So even though there are limited rules for private land, you should still follow ethical standards and I'll co cover those as we move forward. Um, on public land, however, if you are to sell seeds or products grown from or that use those seeds, you will need a commercial seed collection permit. So if you're a landscaper and you wanna go out and collect some seeds on public land to sell to a landowner or to grow out plants for a project, um, you will need a, a commercial seed collection permit. Um, they aren't that expensive and they aren't cumbersome, but you need one, otherwise you're breaking federal laws. Um, that's for commercial use. For personal use, on the other hand, um, it's much different. You can collect some seeds on public land for personal use, 
as long as you don't collect seeds of any listed, protected, or sensitive species, and you won't use the seed for a commercial purpose. Um, the amounts allowed for personal use are pretty generous. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me that you're allowed. Um, you can look that up. But um, in general, if you want a little native lupin from a large patch of lupin on BLM or Forest Service land, and you only take a little for personal use, that's generally within the guidelines of what's allowed, kind of like um, picking morels um, or, fur, or fur boughs for a, a wreath or something like that. Um, so some general guidelines for ethical seed collection are um, that you should never collect seeds from threatened, endangered, uncommon, rare, sensitive species. And it's your responsibility to know, you know what species is what. Um, only collect from large plant populations. Don't collect more than 10 to 30% of available seed from a given plant population. Collect seeds from different areas in different years. Spread seeds as you collect them to help plant populations grow. Make sure to sow seeds into appropriate locations if you do so. Um, and don't over harvest seed, err on the side of caution. Um, and one thing that I always um, try to caution people about too is to be careful when collecting seeds in high use areas as you might not be the only one that's interested in that seed. Um, sometimes I hear people tell me about a heartleaf milkweed population that they get seeds from along a popular trail near Ashland. Um, and I know of the site and it worries me that there's a lot of different people collecting seed from the same site. Um, so just be conscious of that, that some high use areas, you might not be the only one um, that's interested. So, you know, just err on the side of caution, especially in on high use trails. Um, I definitely move around a lot and collect seeds from different sites each year. This is an easy guideline for me because I like to go to different places each year anyway, and I'm always antsy to see new places or go somewhere I haven't been in a long time. Um, but some, you know, more general, more ethical guidelines, you know, again, only collect 10 to 30% of the total seed crop. Um, there's different ethical guidelines, you know, put out by different agencies and different entities. Um, but generally speaking, 10 to 30% keeps you in, in you know, this, a safe uh, zone. So don't collect all the seeds from a site, harvesting 10 to 30% of the seeds in 10% of the year years, every 10 years or less is generally considered safe, but harvesting 50% of seeds in 50% of the years, every other year or more is generally unsafe. Um, so you definitely want to collect, um, you know, less amount and, and infrequently. So less intense, frequent harvests are safer than intense, infrequent harvests. Leave enough seeds as food sources for animals, birds, and insects, and to ensure the reproduction of the population. Avoid soil disturbance and plant damage while collecting seeds, especially in fragile habitats. Uh, make sure you're not spreading non-native plants as you go. Um, clean, your, clean your shoes of weed seeds. Um, if possible, allow an area to rest for at least two growing seasons between collections. Keep in mind that longer periods may be needed for some species and locations. Um, you should store the seeds that you collect in paper bags unless you plan to store them for a long time. Um, initially, the you know paper bags are good because it allows for um, the seeds to dry um, and it allows for natural gas exchanges in the seed, um, whereas some plastic storage can prohibit natural gas exchanges. Um, paper also helps prevent mold and moisture damage. Long-term storage should be done in airtight containers, um, but if you're just going to harvest the seed and sow it that fall, um, just storing it in paper is fine. Um, and keep good records of what species you collected and when you collected it. Uh, make sure to write the name on the bag. Uh, there's been many times I somehow forgot to write the name, and it can be really hard to remember what it was sometimes if it's something that looks similar to another species. Um, so when I go out for a big seed collection trip, this is what it will look like when I bring everything back to wait for seed cleaning. I use specific um, types of paper bags. I prefer gift um, type bags to sandwich bags because they're folded at the bottom and they're less likely to lose seed through holes in the bottoms. And I use large paper grocery bags for the larger seed lots or buckets of varying sizes. Um, so after you collect the seed, if you didn't buy seeds for growing your plants and you went out and collected some seeds, either from the wild or from a garden, because you can surely collect seeds from gardens as well, um, then you can opt to clean the seed. Um, for personal use, cleaning seeds may or may not be optional. Um, there are many species that can be sown into pots without much cleaning necessary. Um, for instance, I typically throw whole berries of elderberries into seed trays and seed pots. 
Um, and for me anyway, they seem to germinate better without being cleaned. Um, you can just throw the whole berry, you know, put a few whole berries into a seed starting tray, you know, in each cell of the tray, um, uncleaned, just right as you, right after you harvest the elderberries. Um, I, I feel like I get better germination that way. Um, I end up cleaning a lot of elderberry seed for sale. Um, so I end up cleaning a bunch anyway, but sometimes, you know, you really don't have to do a lot of seed cleaning depends on what your goals are. Um, and sometimes you just, you do want to clean the seed because you want to be able to clearly see or count how much or how many seeds you placed into a seed starting tray or cell or a seed pot. So cleaning the seed down to where you can get a good count um, can be necessary. Um, other times just sowing the seed with the chaff is fine. Um, mainly you want to make sure that you don't have insects in your seeds that could damage the seeds. And if you're wanting to store the seeds, um, you definitely would want to clean the seed as well because um, you don't want to store seeds uh, with bugs in them. That's You don't want to have that damage or that risk. Um, but I can't tell you how many plants I've grown by just simply throwing some chaffy seeds into a seed pot. And I like to tell people, you know, make it as easy as possible for yourself. Um, either way, um, we'll cover seed cleaning because it's important. Um, so you can use household implements like you see here. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have anything fancy. You can just use strainers, colanders, and other items that will help separate the seed from the chaff. You just place the material you collected into the strainer or colander and break up the material with your hands um, using gloves if needed, and the seed will start to be separated from the chaff. You can use different sized mesh to help separate the different sized seeds. Insects and their pupa are the main source of damage to seeds. Sometimes they can destroy whole seed lots, so that's why cleaning seeds is so important. Uh, most of the time when you remove the seeds from the chaff, you can also separate out insects and pupa, but you really have to pay attention to this aspect and be vigilant. Um, fly pupa is probably the most common insect damage I see in the seeds that I collect, but flies are also important pollinators, you know, so they're just part of the ecosystem. Um, a lot of insects need the seeds just the same um, for their life cycles. Acorns are susceptible to acorn weevil damage. Uh, if, you, if you put the acorns in water, the good acorns will sink to the bottom of the water, while the bad ones will float. Um, so you can discard the floaters and dry the acorns before, before you store or plant them. Um, if you enjoy seed cleaning, this is a handy seed, uh, handy screen set that's available from the Dibvig Seed Cleaner if you're interested in a, in a seed um, cleaning set, a screen set. Um, these fit right into a bucket, which is really nice. And you can use two to three screens at a time with the various um, size screens, uh, the mesh. Um, by stacking them on top of each other so you can get different separation of the seed. Um, this is uh, These photos show sulfur flower buckwheat being screened using these screens. Uh, you can just use your hand to rub the seed on the screens to help separate the seed from the chaff. And if you're handy, you can also make your own screens just using, um, you know, screen, different size screens with different size mesh um, and wooden frames. That's a pretty easy thing to do too. For reference, there's lots of high-tech seed cleaning machines out there that are used for industrial seed cleaning purposes. I use two low-tech seed cleaning machines. I use an antique clipper seed cleaner from the 1920s that still has some leather straps, believe it or not. Um, but you can buy a brand new um, clipper, clipper office tester made by the same company that's a modern design. Um, the clipper uses screens and a fan to blow the chaff away from the seeds. From some, for some species, it works perfectly, but for those like asters and, and milkweed um, species that have airborne like pappus that blows all over the place, um, the fluff just doesn't work in those types of machines. Um, however, this did big seed company um, that makes the screen set um, in Astoria, they make this great seed cleaning machine that I use. Um, it uses spinning action to separate the seed from the chaff. Uh, it's my go-to machine for anything airborne, fluffy, and just large seed lots in general. Um, and it even can clean berries. It can clean wet and dry seed. So we have a lot of um, native plants in our region that produce seeds and fleshy fruit and berries. I collected all these different berries within a few days of each other over this in this during this last summer. So I took some photos to capture the diversity and beauty of all the different shapes and colors. Um, we have a wide variety of fleshy fruits that a lot of different plants produce, and um, they just have a different way of cleaning them. Um, so here they are just kind of waiting to get cleaned, all the different types of berries. Um, kitchen blenders are often used to separate fruits and seeds uh, on a small scale. 
um, in, in a household setting. Um, you can coat the sharp blades with rubberized plastic coating, the same type of material that's used to coat uh, tool handles. Um, it's a long lasting and effective way to prevent the damage to seeds in a blender. Or you can just put rubber or plastic tubing over the blades to prevent seed damage in the blender as well. As you clean seeds, um, you can package them up. Um, if you needed to dry them out, you just lay them out you know, on a, um, in some sort of you know, flat area where the seeds can dry out in a you know, metal tin or you know, a, a kind of flat container so that they have airflow and, and can dry out. Um, so now that you have some seed and you're ready to sow the seeds that you either bought or you collected and cleaned yourself, it's time to move into techniques used to grow native plants from seeds. You have three basic options for using native seeds. You can sow seeds in a nursery to grow out nursery plants. Uh, you can direct sow the seeds into a specific location, like in a garden bed, or you can broadcast the seeds in a larger area. And I'll touch on all three of these different techniques. Um, in nature, seeds are underfoot all the time, pretty much anywhere you go on the soil surface or within the soil seed bank. Soil seed banks are nature's insurance against harsh conditions and unfavorable years. Now, the big super blooms in California are caused by higher rainfall. So seeds that were dormant for many, many years, sometimes decades, are finally able to germinate with high rainfall. Um, in our neck of the woods, wildfires stimulate super blooms, coaxing dormant seeds um, that have been in the soil seed bank for many years to germinate. Seeds are naturally distributed um, by the wind, by water, by animals and, and ants, and even in this photo on the left, even you know ants and, and yellow jackets, which yellow jackets actually can move trillium seeds around um, because they eat the fleshy seed coat. Um, and then the right-hand photo there, you can see um, an Oregon grape seedlings emerging from bear scat on my land. Um, plants uh, have to produce an overabundance of seeds to ensure their survival because most seedlings in the wild don't survive. Um, this bear pooped in a really dry area that's not good conditions for Oregon grape, and every one of these little seedlings died. Um, so that's just, you know, something to think about. Um, seed dormancy is one of the most important topics to learn about when it comes to growing native plants from seed. Um, just like the super blooms, you know, you think of like the seeds are dormant in, this, in the soil until a big rain event, and then they come to life. Um, and that's what seed dormancy, the seeds are dormant, waiting for the right conditions. So many species can sit in the soil for years and stay viable and not germinate if the conditions aren't right. Um, seed longevity varies from species to species. Some species like maples and lilies have seeds that need to be sown in their first year as they don't stay viable for more than a year or two at most. Other species can remain viable for up to 100 years or, or anywhere in between. Um, and in our era, area, there hasn't been a lot of studies on the longevity, longevity of our native, uh, native plant seeds. Um, so it's just to assume that there's a, a wide, it varies widely. Um, and there's some general rule of thumbs about that. Um, the best way to store seeds for a long time is in a cool, dark, and dry location. Some native plant seeds can last for decades this way. I recently found some really old native tobacco seed that I had forgotten about that was at least 15 years old or more, and it germinated just fine. Um, but the dormancy trait can be hard to overcome for other species too, to get them to germinate if they've been dormant for a long time. Um, as some species go into a deeper dormancy, the longer the seed is stored. Um, so if they've been stored for a long time, it may take more exposure to cold, moist conditions or repeat exposure to get the seed coat to break down and trigger germination. Um, so um, you can sometimes seeds that are fresh may germinate right away in the fall, but if they're stored for a while, they then may need that cold moist stratification. So um, seed dormancy plays into seed germination a lot. So some, some seeds, you know, they need the right weather, moisture and conditions in the wild to germinate. And we just have to replicate that. Um, in a controlled setting, if we're growing them in a nursery or in, you know, um, in the landscape, in order to get the seeds to germinate for for us, um, and so in order to get seeds to germinate, we have to mimic natural conditions and natural life cycle patterns of the native plants we want to grow, um, and that's where getting to know the plants in the wild can be really helpful because you kind of get to know what they like in the wild setting. 
Um, and some seeds don't have seed dormancy at all. Um, they will germinate as soon as they have exposure to the right temperature and wet water conditions. Um, they don't need any long-term cold moist stratification or anything like that. Um, so some rules, rules of thumb, um, sow seeds in the fall. If this species has, has seeds that are dormant, that must overwinter in the soil to germinate. Um, some examples are included on this slide, black, black cap raspberry, vanilla leaf, purple flower honeysuckle, California coffee berry. You can see the diversity in all those different seeds there, the different colors and different shapes. Um, and also for seeds that are not dormant, but only germinate in cool temperatures and grow actively in the early winter and fall. Um, these species are usually also early bloomers like sea blush and clarkia. Um, and also um, sow seeds in the fall for species that have significantly higher summer survival or an increase in flowering if fall sown. And that's true for some of our native grasses like blue wild, wye, blue wild rye and California brome. And, you know, even though all, all the seeds can be planted in the fall, um, some, some can, you can wait till spring if you need to or want to. Um, and species that can be sown in the spring include seeds that are not dormant, but require the warmth of late spring or, or to trigger germination, uh, like sedges and yarrow. Um, seedlings that are very small and grow slowly in cool weather, but vigorously in warm temperatures, like asters and goldenrod. Um, or seedlings that have low winter establishment or survival due to wet and cold conditions or no, no growth advantages to fall sowing. An example of that would be silver bush lupin in the nursery. Um, it, it tends to rot out um, if it's left sitting out in wet uh, conditions in the nursery setting. Um, but silver bush lupin does, usually does great if fall sown with direct sowing into the ground. In our area, cold moist stratification is the best way to help seeds overcome dormancy if they go dormant. Cold moist stratification is just that. Um, it's exposure to both cold and moist conditions at the same time. In nature, plants drop their seeds and the seeds sit on the soil surface and get assimilated into the top layer of soil. And they sit there until the fall rain arrives. Um, some seeds that aren't dormant may germinate immediately with the first fall rain. Um, for seeds that are dormant, they may need to wait for months of exposure to cold moist conditions and the freeze thaw cycle of winter conditions in order to break down their seed coat and trigger springtime germination. And the best way to do that, um, to mimic that, that natural cycle is to sow native seeds in the fall to early winter and leave them outside and exposed to winter conditions. Or you can use an open or unheated hoop house as long as it stays cold in the winter. Um, but then you would need to water the seeds over the winter, you know, because they're not going to get access to rain. Um, you can you can use seed starting trays, pots, six packs, or any type of seed starting container. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about containers, um, but you know, I'm a, I'm an advocate for using what you have on hand as much as you can. Um, so you can place several seeds per cell in a seed tray, like shown in this photo on the bottom left. You can sow seeds into larger seed starting trays like the center bottom photo. Um, with this method, you would want to prick each seedling out to transplant it. Same with the top right photo. You can lightly sow seeds into a gallon pot. And then when a bunch of seedlings emerge, you prick them out individually to pot them up or transplant them. Um, the bottom right photo shows the use of six pack trays. Um, these are commonly used at local nurseries. Um, and people have easy access to the six pack type of trays. Um, they work just fine for getting seeds started. You'll have to upsize them for things that are that are deep rooted. Um, the top left photo shows the use of bird netting. It's very common for birds, mice, and other critters to enjoy eating the seeds or even more yummy and delicious are the germinating seeds. Um, so covering the trays with bird netting helps prevent predation of the seeds. Uh, if you've spent good money and, and time on getting the, to this point, it can be devastating to have critters eat all your germinating seeds. So here's some different seedlings after they've started to emerge. Oregon sunshine, broadleaf lupin, silver lupin, arrowleaf buckwheat, and showy milkweed. Seedlings will emerge during the winter to early spring at very different times. Some will start emerging in fall even with fall rain, as I mentioned. Uh, if the seeds don't have dormancy. Um, but even dormant seeds can start emerging as early as February, right in the middle of cold winter, 
Um, but some will wait until as late as May. Um, species like milkweed are kind of notoriously late germinators um, and anywhere in between. Um, some, some species prefer to germinate early to get their roots down early in the season to help them get through the summer drought better with a better established root system. Um, they clearly have super cold tolerance, you know, to be able to just germinate in the dead of winter. They just stay tiny little small seedlings and they just sit there under the snow and enduring all the super cold winter conditions. Um, and they won't start to really grow above ground until the weather warms up. Um, but they are growing their roots during that time. Um, some that germinate later require warmer weather to germinate. Um, so seed germination times in the spring run the gamut. Um, and it depends on a lot of varying conditions um, for the species. Here's what the germinated seed pots look like. You can see that you can grow a ton of plants in a small space. Uh, it's a lot more tedious work to prick out the seedlings for transplanting this way, but it's a good method and sometimes allows you to just quickly sow some uncleaned chaffy seed in a pot and for forget about it. And then voila, in the spring, you've got a bunch of seedlings. Um, one note of caution is that um, sometimes if you don't have good ventilation or airflow or you're just overwatering, you can get dampen damping off and get molds and rot um, and die off from the seedlings if they're because they're growing so close together. Um, so that's just something to be cautious of. Um, but in general, this method works well. Um, it, last uh, spring, I visited the um, North Coast chapter in, of California Native Plant Society, and they have a big uh, native plant nursery there in Arcata area. And um, they grow almost all of their nursery plants in through this method. And they have volunteers that prick all the individual plants out and uh, pot them up. On the flip side, some species need heat treatment for the seeds to, uh, to get them to germinate. Almost all the species that live in our region are fire adapted since we live in a fire adapted ecosystem. But some species in particular actually need the heat of wildfire to help their seeds germinate. Species like knobcone pines that have serotonous cones that are sealed closed with pitch, they need heat from fire to open up the cones and release the seeds. You can mimic this by putting the cones in an oven or placing them next to a hot wood stove in the winter. Um, both of those work well to open up um, serotonous cones uh, to get the seed out. Other species like manzanita and broad, broad leaved lotus need actual heat on the seeds themselves to get them to germinate. They have really heavy, thick seed coats that need some sort of damage to be able to get them the seeds to germinate. Um, most often in nature, this is achieved by wildfire, sometimes uh, bird scat, you know, bird going through digestion of an animal. Um, but these days it can also be uh, accomplished with mechanical damage. Um, sometimes in bulldozed areas where there's a bunch of manzanita seeds, um, the bulldozing action will scarify the seeds, it'll uh, damage the seeds. And because the manzanita got damaged, you'll just see like whole areas just like just covered in manzanita seedlings because of that, um, that the damage to the seeds during that uh, disturbance. Um, sometimes you can just actually cut the seeds with a knife to achieve this or put them in a rock tumbler. Um, Yerbasanta is another species that needs heat treatment for seed germination. This evergreen shrub grows in harsh soils in sun baked locations and has beautiful tubular flowers. I use a small handheld propane torch to help fire off the chaff and break down the hard seed coats. Some people have had success using, using liquid smoke um, as well with this species. But using a torch in a metal bucket has worked well for me for that species. Heat treatment can also be easily achieved with hot water treatment. Uh, you can just boil water, take it off the stove, place it in a container and immerse, immerse the seeds in the hot but not boiling water. Um, then just let the seeds sit there and imbibe the water and get swollen overnight as the water cools. Um, and then you can drain the water and sow the seeds. Um, these photos are showing heat treatment of Western redbud seeds. Um, the hot water treatment works well for this species. Um, it's interesting that these, these tan seeds here, um, after hot water treatment, they actually kind of turn the, the water a slight green color after they soak um, in the hot water for a while, which is kind of cool um, reaction. So, and other seeds, they change the water different colors too. So it's quite fascinating. Um, keep in mind that adaptations to germinating following fire are not necessarily related to the heat or flames themselves, although that is important for some species like the red bud I'm showing here and the previous species I mentioned. 
Uh, many times wildflowers and plants are germinating and establishing following wildfire from chemical cues in the soil, generally a change in pH from the ash and the soot. Um, when the chemical changes occur after wildfire in the soil, it signals to the seeds that it's time to germinate because the conditions are right. Um, they will be naturally fertilized with lots of great minerals in the ashy soil, and there will be more light for them to grow immediately following a fire since the area will be cleared of vegetation. So wildfire is beneficial while triggering native seed germination for reasons other than just the heat and the flame, um, although it's an, that is an important factor as well. Okay, I didn't want to spend a ton of time on scarification and heat treatment because it's it's used less often than cold moist stratification, but it's imp important to mention. Um, so returning um, to that, I wanted to mention, you know, I'm, I've, I've mainly am advocating for people around this neck of the woods, you know, Southern Oregon, Northern, Northern California. Um, you know, we have enough cold in the winter to just let the seeds sit outside over the winter, do fall sowing. Um, we don't necessarily need to do um, artificial cold moist stratification. Um, but there are people like people that live closer to the coast that don't have cold winters or people that live in, in, in you know, like Southern California or climates where climates where they don't have a lot of cold. Um, you know, they may need to use artificial cold stratification um, to get tr the seeds to germinate. Um, and, you know, also just sometimes people are just late on uh, getting their seeds sown and maybe they waited too late and they need to do it artificially if they want to still get them to germinate that year. Um, so there's reasons to do it, um, but um, the seeds can be placed in bags or cheesecloth with a variety of substances. Um, substrates help maintain the moisture level during stratification. So common stratification substrates, if you're trying to artificially cold moist stratify, would include uh, moist sand, peat moss, sprouting paper, vermiculite, and then you just store the seeds in the fridge at low temperatures until the stratification requirement is satisfied. Here's a method that works well too. Um, this is the sandwich stratification method. You place one layer of seeds on a stack of moist paper towels or seed germinating paper, fold them over and place in a Ziploc bag. You want the paper only moist, not sopping wet. You don't want it dripping water, just moist. Um, here's photos of choke cherry seeds being artificially cold moist stratified. Uh, you can use cheesecloth or netting and place the seeds in moist peat moss and place the seeds in the refrigerator. Uh, most nurseries that do this at scale have refriger refrigerators dedicated um, to the cold moist stratification. They can put whole uh, seed trays, you know, stacks and stacks of seed trays into large refrigeration to do this. Um, but you can do it in your personal fridge as well. And um, there shouldn't be any issues with your food in the fridge and you can cover it with a plastic bag. Um, once the seeds have sprouted in artificial cold moist stratification conditions, the seeds can be sown just like normal seeds with the sprout facing down into the soil. So the root system faces downward. Um, so here's choke cherry germinates, mule's ear germinates, um, and, mule, and milkweed. So you can see all the little uh, sprouties occurring there. Um, and this photo on the left shows seeds germinated on seed sprouting paper artificially um, using the refrigeration. Um, but you can use paper towels um, and not just sprouting paper. The sprouting paper is kind of like a um, technical type paper like the, the industry uses, and you can purchase it online, um, but paper towels work as well. Um, they just kind of hold the moisture a little better. Um, and then, you know, after they're sprouted artificially, those germinated seeds are sown onto the soil surface of the growing medium, and then very lightly covered with uh, grit or soil for growth. Typically for reference in general for both unsprouted and sprouted seeds, the rule of thumb is to cover seeds with soil at the same depth that the seed is wide. So if a seed is one eighth inch thick, only cover the seed with one eighth, in, one eighth inch of soil. If the seed is very tiny, it might be best <clears throat> not to cover it at all, or just to provide like a light dusting of soil on top. Um, burying seeds too deeply can keep them dormant. Um, it, it makes the seeds just think that they're just buried deep and you know, they're just they're just waiting to come to the soil surface um, and it, that can prevent seed germination. Uh, more seeds fail to germinate from being buried too deeply and some species shouldn't be covered at all. Um, many species actually need light to germinate. Um, so if you cover them, you may fail to get germination. A common example of that is yarrow. Um, yarrow seeds are tiny and paper thin. Um, 
So that's something good to know. Phacelias are also another species that shouldn't be covered. They need, they prefer to have light to germinate. Um, some winter when I have time, I have a great, you know, native seed germination chart that has, you know, uh, protocols for uh, cold moist stratification, but I, I don't necessarily have everything listed that needs um, light. I do for some of them, but um, that's important information. So here is the cycle of germination for choke cherry seeds. You have the flowering plant that produces the seeds. The seeds are placed in cheesecloth and peat moss for 120 days in the fridge, moist. Um, they germinate, um, then they're placed in the soil to grow, and then you have the finished plant ready to be planted. You can achieve these finished plants by germinating the seeds artificially, as shown in the slide, or alternatively, the, you know, around here, you can just sow the seeds in the fall and leave the tray, you know, the seed starting trays outside all winter and let nature do the work for you. Um, I don't usually use cold moist stratification um, artificially myself when I grow native plants here. I just let nature do the work for me outside. Um, but it's good to know about artificial cold stratification because sometimes it's helpful. Um, and I've used a lot of that method in nursery work um, when I've worked at nurseries previously. Um, a lot of native plant growers that grow large quantities of native plants like to do artificial um, cold moist stratification because it's can you know it gives you more exacting control over the germination. You know you can you know get it you know dialed right into the exact needs. Whereas natural weather, you know, it's variable, it's unpredictable. It's kind of nature, you know there's ebbs and flows of weather conditions and it's sometimes unpredictable. So um, there's some reasons why using artificial methods can be helpful. Um, here's mule's ear seed um, also uh, through grown through artificial cold moist stratification. So as I mentioned before, after you achieve germination of seeds, uh, you need to upsize the seedlings into the appropriately sized nursery pot or container. If you grew your seedlings in seed trays, then you simply just pop the little seedlings out of the cells of the tray or out of the six pack or whatever type of, um, you know, seed, seed growing tray you're using and plant them into the soil um, of a pot or, or direct, directly plant them outside. Um, however, however, if you grew seeds in trays or seedling pots, you have to prick them out like shown in this slide and individually plant them into the soil. Um, it's time consuming, but it can save a lot of, of space. Um, and if you if you start your seeds outside, let them overwinter outside, um, it's best to let the seeds germinate outside. Um, you'll get the best germination if you let them germinate outside because um, you'll want to give them the, the exposure to the cold, moist conditions of winter conditions right up until they germinate. Um, but once you get the germin germ germination achieved, you can then bring those inside to a greenhouse um, that can help the plants um, because sometimes if things get overwatered once they germinate, they might dampen off and and you know and rot out. Um, so that can help um, with that. Um, and it also just a little warmth after they've germinated can help stimulate more growth. It's not necessary, you know. There's different methods. You can have the huge, large greenhouses that commercial native plant growing, or just a small hoop house on the land that you live on. Um, I strongly encourage people to use recycled nursery pots as much as possible to reduce plastic pollution. I try my best to use mostly recycled containers, uh, but each year I end up buying, you know, some new ones, which I hate to do as it's terrible plastic that gets, you know, shipped from halfway across the world. But I think if we all make an effort to recycle and reuse pots, we'll make a difference. If you do buy new ones, Stewie and Sons up north in Tangent in the Willamette Valley is one of the best suppliers in our region. They have all different shapes and sizes for all different kinds of species. Um, and they have seed starting trays as well um, with different shaped pots for older established plants. And, you know, the seed starting trays, I like to use these kind down here. When it comes to containers and uh, pots, what size and depth you use is important. Plants that ha have fibrous root systems, like shown on the lower right is examples of fibrous root systems. Um, they can be grown in shallower pots because their root systems can just kind of swirl around and move around to fill out the container. However, plants with deep root systems like bulbs, corms, tap roots, et cetera, um, should have deeper containers so the roots can go deep in the soil. Uh, geophytes, meaning plants that, have, that grow from bulbs, corms, tubers, et cetera, are very slow growing from seed. 
but you can grow them. Um, but if they stay in a container for more than a few months, they'll need a, a deeper container, at least five to nine inches or more. Um, they won't do well in a traditional four inch pot, for instance. Um, growing geophytes from seed can take anywhere from three to five years to get a flowering plant because they're putting all their energy at first into growing their nu their nutrient and water storage systems, which um, is the, the bulb or the corm. Um, and they're just putting all their energy into that at first to endure to help them endure summer drought. Um, so they're just slow growing. Here's another beautiful geophyte, Harvest Brodia. Yeah, you can sometimes buy bulbs um, for transplanting. Um, so you can get in a you know a mature plant right away. Um, but they are, they are, um, you can grow them from seed. You just have to be patient. Uh, it's kind of like growing an orchard. You just have to be patient. So here's a diagram depicting the difference um, between a fibrous root system and a tap root. Tap roots are like carrots, they're long and deep, um, tapping into nutrient and water deeper in the down in the soil. A lot of our most drought tolerant plants are tap rooted. Um, species like balsam root, lomatiums, heartleaf milkweed, some horchelias, mule's ears all have tap roots. <clears throat> Both showy and narrow leaf milkweed plants have rhizomatous root systems where the rhizomes spread laterally, whereas the more uncommon heartleaf milkweed grows from a tap root. The seeds germinate readily but need to be upsized into a deeper container. You can start them by seed uh, by seed pot too and then prick out the transplants. You can see from the size of the roots of this coast man root or wild cucumber, sometimes just referred to um, the name of its genus, Mara, um, that they these won't easily fit into a small container. Um, this is a big vining native plant that grows throughout the region and produces something akin to a spiny cucumber with large seeds in it. It's called man root because the roots are said to get to be the size of a man. Um, so this species needs to eventually be upsized into either a gallon or larger if it's going to be grown in a container for some time. Um, and the deeper, the better. This was a seed pot of Mara that I grew. Um, I got, got a lot of plants out of that. Um, this is me with a soap root plant. I mentioned it earlier. Um, it uh, grows from a big bulb that can be pounded into a soap. It has a lot of cultural significance. Um, it's a night blooming species. And you can see it gets really tall. Um, that's me standing next to one at the um, Troon Vineyard Native Plant Botanical Garden that I helped create in, in the Applegate. Um, and here are the mature root systems of the soap root. Um, you know, they're huge. They're big, big roots. Um, I grow this species from seed and it can take up to five years to get a flowering plant, um, but it's so worth it because it's a great plant. Um, I mostly just direct seed it. Um, I feel like it does better just direct seeding, um, but I also have grown it in nursery pots from seed as well. Um, you just need to get it into the ground the first year or it's going to become problematic in the pot after a while because it's just really big. Um, so I haven't really spent any time on talking a, about soil mixes. That's an entire presentation on its own. Um, but I will just mention that it's always a good idea to have extra perlite on hand to help with better soil drainage. Um, especially our most drought tolerant natives um, will always grow better if they have a really well drained soil mix um, while in containers. Many of them can absolutely tolerate heavy clay soil when they're in the ground, when they're growing in the ground. Um, and they're adapted to heavy clay soils in their native habitats. Um, but in the nursery setting, it's easy to overwater drought tolerant plants. And they probably die from overwatering more um, than from underwatering. So extra perlite um, in your soil mix can help with that. Um, otherwise, just a basic all-purpose potting soil will work well for most native plants. Um, and just remember that plants that are being grown in nursery pots, you know, they don't have access to the mycorrhizal um, communities that live in the soils. And so, you know, those mycorrhizal plant communities, the fungal communities in the soil help plants uptake nutrients. And when they're growing in the in a pot, they don't have that ability. So you do need to give them a little bit of fertilizer. You can just use basic organic fertilizer, um, depending on the species, you can adjust it. Um, but if you keep a native plant in a pot for a while, you're gonna need to give it a little fertilizer to keep it growing strong. Um, whereas if that species gets planted in, the, in native soil um, in the ground, they're gonna be able to provide their own nutrients. Um, but uh, you know, with in conjunction with mycorrhizal communities in the soil. Um, some people use jiffy pots and other thing, um, other products like that to help um, them start uh, seeds. Um, you can also buy 
uh, commercial seed starting um, soil mixes that are just real fine soil mixes, and that can be helpful as well. Um, I think Jiffy Pots might make a fully biodegradable product now when they started out and they might still make them the, the, even though people plant them directly in the ground, they contain some plastic, which is not good for our microplastic problem. Um, but if you can get something like earth pots, um, or, you know, a biodegradable pots that are made of cow dung and other natural substances that you can just directly plant in the ground, you can grow native plants like that too. You know, there's, there's lots of different ways to grow native plants. Um, so now I'm going to move on to talking about specific pretreatment requirements for various select species throughout the region. Um, I'm just going to kind of touch on different ones just to kind of give people a, diff a feel um, for the variety of the different um, amounts, of, the amounts of pretreatment or not um, that that species need. Um, so I'm starting with uh, with species that don't have dormant seeds and they don't really need pretreatment. Um, so this includes silver lupin, cardinal monkey flower, and goldenrods. Um, any of these can be sown at any time when there's adequate moisture and they will germinate. Um, the, the lupin can germinate, you know, it starts, I've already been seeing lots of silver bush lupin uh, seedlings all over the place um, germinating this fall with fall rain. So they can germinate in the fall or they can germinate, you know, sometimes throughout the winter off and on and into the spring. Um, and the monkey flower and goldenrod usually wait until temperatures have warmed up a bit. Lupins in general don't need any pretreatment, like I mentioned. However, 30 days of exposure to cold, moist conditions or hot water soak can help with more un uniform germination. Um, lupins tend to germinate erratically, um, not at all the same at the same time. Um, so if you sow the seeds at one time, you know, you may get some that germinate right away and then some that germinate a few months later and some that don't germinate until the next year. <laughs> you know, they're just really erratic. You know, each seed has is its own living being and they have a mind of their own, so to speak. So um, that can be it can be kind of annoying when you're trying to grow a lot of plants. Um, so sometimes even if a species doesn't require pretreatment, um, if you give it a little exposure to cold, moist conditions or a, a heat for lupins, particular um, a heat, hot water soak, it can help. Um, help make the germination more uniform. Um, the other lupins I just showed were perennials, but we also have annual lupins like this one here, the bicolor lupin. Um, in, in general, a lot of the native asters don't need any pretreatment or cold moist stratification. However, they can still be sown in the fall and early winter with the rest of your seeds if you'd like to keep it simple and only sow seeds at one time. Um, they can sit out all winter. They just don't necessarily need to. So if you wait until early spring, like March or April, to sow the seeds, you'll be fine as well. Um, we've got lots of great native asters, and they're all fairly easy to grow from seed um, and just beautiful, great pollinator plants. Um, some species in the aster family, like western joe pie weed, agrotina occidentalis, this species um, doesn't also does not have dormant seeds, and it can uh, doesn't need any pretreatment. Um, also shrubs in the aster plant family, like rubber rabbit brush, um, these seeds don't need pretreatment. Um, finding viable seeds of rabbit brush in the wild can be hard. <laughs> um, there's a reason I don't sell it on my website. I sometimes find uh, rabbit brush, viable rabbit brush seeds, and I'll use it to grow plants out. Um, but it just has, um, insects love the seeds of rabbit brush. They just tend to get a lot of insect damage. So um, finding viable seeds can be kind of difficult. Um, species that need only 30 days of cold moist stratification include waxy comb flower and coyote mint. Uh, Oregon sunshine only needs 30 days cold moist stratification. Probably, people are probably familiar with Oregon sunshine. It's pretty well known. In California, they don't call it Oregon sunshine. It's called woolly sunflower. So, um, but I love the name Oregon sunshine. Um, also, western comb flower, big low sneezeweed, and verily facilia only need 30 days cold moist stratification. For people just starting out with growing native plants, you know, for their first time, I recommend starting with species that only need a short duration of cold moist stratification. Um, just in general, they're just easier to grow um, than the ones that need longer um, stratification. It just they have a little bit more uh, margin of error that you can work with um, if you're just starting out. Um, native bunch grasses such as uh, Romer's fescue provide pollinator habitat. Butterflies use native grasses as larval host plants and bumblebees will use the root systems as uh, ground nesting sites. Um, these species need 30 days 
cold moist stratification, the Romer's fescue. Um, same with its relative California fescue. Um, this is a bigger, taller, more robust um, fescue than the Romer's fescue, uh, but it also needs about 30 days cold moist stratification. Um, then species that need just a little longer, like 30 to 60 days stratification include horse mint, which is a great plant in the mint family, great pollinator species, fireweed and Idaho gumweed fit into this category as well. Um, the 30 to 60 days is a range. Also Pacific hound's tongue, which is a wonderful larval host plant for the hound's tongue woolly bear moth, um, which you can see the caterpillar, you can see the, the moth and the caterpillar there in those, in those photos. Um, and uh, one of our few native vines, Western clematis seeds need 30 to 60 days. Um, clematis tends to kind of grow in a little bit uh, more in the riparian regions around our, around our area. Um, as well as our native milkweeds, they typically take about 45 days. Um, so they fit into that 30 to 60 day category. Um, and it can vary a lot by seed lot. You know, this is true for any species, depending on where the seed's from. Um, seeds collected in a lower, hotter location may need less cold moist stratification than seeds collected at 4,000 foot feet in the foothills. Um, so that's always something to keep in mind. The needs of seeds do vary depending on where they were collected. Um, higher elevation seeds may need more um, cold moist stratification than lower elevation needs seeds. So, you know, Oregon sunshine that grows at valley bottom, you know, might need a different amount or slightly various, varied amount of cold moist stratification compared to seed that, you know, is growing at 7,000 feet. Um, narrow leaf milkweed also 30 to 60 and heart leaf or purple milkweed 30 to 60. Wild buckweeds, buckwheats um, in general need about 60 days cold moist stratification. These are species in the genus Eriogonum. We have a lot of wonderful buckwheats and they are super plants for pollinators. You gotta have some buckwheats in your garden, your native plant garden or in any habitat restoration project. There's buckwheats that grow in just about every type of habitat in our region and they're just wonderful plants. Um, Oregon has 45 eriogonum species or different types of, of buckwheat and California has 121 plus many, many varieties. So there's lots of different types of buckwheat. Sulfur flower buckwheat shown here um, is one of the, probably the most common uh, buckwheat and the one that people know the most. Um, so they all need um, six, 60 days. Um, so these are more of the great buckwheats, tall woolly buckwheat, bare stem buckwheat, arrow leaf buckwheat, sulfur flower, I already mentioned. Um, so all the seeds need 60 days. Here's some photos of the different buckwheat seeds. Um, they tend to all kind of look similar, um, slight differences in, in shape and, and size, um, like bare stem buckwheat, which is a smaller buckwheat, has a really tiny seed, um, but similar shape and look to it. So needing slightly longer are ucow, checker mallow, and lomatiums like fern leaf biscuit root, which all need 60 to 90. So you're kind of inching a little higher here into species that need just a little bit longer time um, exposure to cold, moist conditions. Our native lanisteras or honeysuckles, um, which are vines. Um, we have some shrubs that are honeysuckle shrubs too, but um, ones that are more common are usually vines. Um, and they need 60 to 90 days. Um, they make great plants, you know, the pink honeysuckle here, um, and we have the orange one and a yellow one that all combine vine onto trellises and, and fence lines, and they're, they're great for um, creating a native, um, a native archway and things like that. Our native lomatiums are super important larval host plants for species like the Anna swallowtail butterfly. All of our lomatium seeds need about 60 to 90 days cold moist stratification. Um, they're all pretty similar in the needs, the, co the cold moist stratification needs. And then there's species that need two different, two to three or sometimes three different types of treatment. Um, so uh, this is deer brush. This is one of our Ceanothus, um, Ceanothus intergeramus. Some people call it wild lilac. Um, it's a larval host plant for numerous species, including California tortoise shell butterflies and the elegant sheep moth. Um, so this one needs to have hot water treatment um, and cold moist stratification. So it needs heat and cold um, to help give good uniform germination. 
Um, so you'll get more complete germination from these seeds if you give it a heat treatment, you know, put it in, in hot water for 24 hours, sow the seeds, and then let it sit out over the winter. Native camas seeds of both great camas and small camas need 60 to 90 as well. Um, this is a white line sphinx, sphinx moth um, pollinating camas at dusk. Moths are important pollinators as well. This is our one of our beautiful native thistles, the western or cobwebby thistle. Um, this also needs 60 to 90 days. Um, the gorgeous bright red native thistle is a larval host plant for the melita crescent butterfly. Um, so if you see a bright red thistle, don't think it's a weed, don't pull it. Um, the red ones are, are native. Uh, we do have non-native um, invasive thistles as well. They're usually pink. Um, some species that need 90 days include mule's ears and balsam roots. Um, some of our drought tolerant small sunflower plants that grow from deep trap roots and dry and some baked habitats. So mule's ears, balsam root, um, usually balsam root blooms earlier than the mule's ears. Um, but they look similar, you know, once you kind of get to know them, you can see the differences in their leaf shape and, and, and whatnot, but, um, and also Oregon grape needs 90 days. So kind of moving into some of the um, species that need longer durations, 90 to 120 days, you have mock orange and red flowering currant, some of our beautiful native shrubs, also ocean spray. Um, this is the ocean spray fairy moth that uses uh, ocean spray as a larval host plant. I think it's one of the cutest little moths we have. Um, so a lot of times you'll see it around ocean spray, ocean spray plants. Also lilies, um, leopard lily, um, bear grass, giant larkspur or mountain larkspur, tower larkspur, that uh, giant larkspur that grows in the high country goes by lots of different common names. Um, they all need 90 to 120 days. Same with choke cherry, one of our great deciduous suckering shrubs or small trees that has those beautiful pendulous white flowers in the spring and bright red berries in the summer. Uh, it's a larval host plant for the two-tailed swallowtail butterfly. Um, and then once you, once you have mature plants that you've grown out from seeds and you're ready to plant in the ground, spring and fall are the best times of year. Um, if you're going to be planting in areas without irrigation, Fall planting is pretty much a must um, as the plants need time to get established before the summer dry period. Um, you can plant a little later into the spring if you have access to irrigation to help the plants get established in the first year. Um, but fall planting is definitely preferred for, for most native plants, um, especially in, in dry areas without irrigation. Um, most drought tolerant native plants grow in poor soils and don't need much for soil amendment and any you can generally plant into native soil. Um, some more moist loving species that grow in richer soils, you know, in their in their native habitat could use some soil amendment if the soil is of poor quality. Um, so you can just plant natives out like normal landscapes, you know, as you see in this photo, it's just, you know, spacing out the plants and putting bark mulch like a traditional um, garden you know, as shown here in a project that I did um, at a, a fishing retreat on the Klamath River. Um, here's some examples of how that can look, you know, just typical plant and, and put bark mulch around. Um, and you can just do that, you know, you know, just in kind of traditional garden design. Um, you can use small spaces, you know, to liven up and provide, you know, bursts of color and habitat in even just the suburban environment. This is a little uh, plant garden I did at my mom's house. Um, so just even a small spot, you know, can create a lot of habitat. You don't have to do huge projects. You can just take a little spot and make it, you know, a little pollinator oasis with lots of beautiful flowering plants. Um, rock gardens are great places to grow native plants. Um, you can mimic natural rock, rocky habitats. Um, you know, a lot of native plants like to grow in rocky areas. Um, so if you have rocks in your landscape, you can kind of work with that and grow native plants in there. Um, seed increase fields for native plants are more and more common as the interest in native plants grow. Um, these are seed increase rows of milkweed and coyote mint at J. Herbert Stone Nursery in Central Point. Um, this is the BLM and, and Forest Service facility. They grow out large amounts of native plants for seed use on federal lands. Um, this is a good way to produce a lot of seed, but combating the weed competition so the seed lots don't get contaminated with weed seeds is challenging in this kind of environment. Um, so they either have to use a lot of black 
black plastic row covers or a lot of herbicides to keep the, the seed pure and keep down uh, weed contamination. Uh, you can also use native seeds to just direct sow um, seeds into garden beds. This works well too. Um, just make sure you have open areas with bare soil uh, because the, the seeds need contact with soil to germinate. So you can't just sow seeds into a lawn or a, a horse pasture that has lots of thick grasses. You know, if you just throw them into an area that has a lot of competition, um, they're not going to grow well. Um, they may not grow at all. They may not germinate at all because they may not even get down to where they have contact with the soil. Um, so soil seed seed uh, contact is really important. So um, you can see in that photo on the right hand side, those seedlings are germinating there and they kind of have an open space where there's less competition and then they kind of fill in over time. Um, and you can use targeted seeding too for individual plants like these plants here where just lupin seed was just placed right there on site, seeded direct sown into the ground, um, and then they just grow right there on site. You know, you don't necessarily need to start, um, you know, potted nursery plants ahead of time. And silver lupin, I think, does better on a level through direct seeding. Um, transplants and garden and nursery plants work good too, but direct seeding, they just usually do really well. For larger seeding projects, you can do solarization or tarping to kill off the existing vegetation and weed seeds in the soil seed bank. Um, so this solarizes the soil and helps kill off, you know, the the existing the existing weed seeds. So you don't have the same um, pressure of competition when your native seedlings start to germinate. Um, you can do it in smaller spaces too. Um, working with a local woman who wants to, who's uh, seeding this smaller space this fall. So she's solarizing the bed. Uh, she solarized it over the summer to prepare it for false uh, seed sowing. And here's another um, example of an area that's, um, you know, using tarping to cover weeds for throughout the summer that's going to be seeded next week also um, in Ashland. And, you know, even the agencies will use uh, tarping to control um, noxious weeds. You know, this is an example of the Klamath National Forest that used tarping to control spotted knapweed. And then they can sow after they pull that up. Um, they can sow native seeds into the area to, to restore the area. You can also use hydro seeding for establishing native plants. I created um, some native plant gardens on Mount Ash and Ski Road on private land using hydro seeding initially because we were worried about um, the seed um, having erosion, er eroding away because the soil is a lot of decomposed granite that's highly erosive. Um, and the hydro seeding helped hold the seed in place. Um, so this is the re result three years later. This is kind of more wildscaping, um, less traditional landscaping, you know, no no bark mulch and all that, just more wildscaping and kind of meadow creation. Um, we had about 36 different species established in the first year and more species were uh, added as the years went on. Um, here's some photos showing how it looked in the first three years of growth. And this is what you get when you direct sow um, the first season you know, it's very sparse. You have a lot of annuals that bloom, but the, the perennials just stay really tiny and small. They're putting their energy into their roots. Um, and then the second season you get, you know, more growth. And then the in third season, it starts to shift from annuals to perennials as the perennials grow. So we also added seeds to different areas like rock walls and rock gardens there on the property. And um, here's some different photos of how things are looking. Um, so this project's in its sixth year. Um, we did a couple workshops up there this summer um, in, co in collaboration with Pollinator Project Rogue Valley. Uh, we took people there in, in the middle of summer to just kind of look at the at the gardens and how it was talk about how that was established. And then in September, we went back and we revisited the site for a seed collection workshop with some hands-on work as well. Um, and more for more detailed information on growing native plants through direct seeding, you can also check out my presentation about the creation of the Troon Vineyard Native Plant and Pollinator Botanical Garden that I helped establish a few years ago at Troon Vineyard in the Applegate Valley. Um, you can watch the Zoom presentation online at this web address. Um, there's lots of good information, photos, and details in there about direct seeding methods and management of seeded areas. Um, so I won't spend time um, in this particular presentation about this project because 
you can just watch uh, a recorded presentation about it. Um, I've been giving a free guided tour of the site uh, every summer, and I hope to do it again next summer. Um, so that's a great, great source to like learn more about direct seeding methods. So this is the true native plant pollin and pollinator botanical garden um, over three years, um, established almost entirely from direct seeding. So it was just bare soil. First year, there was um, a lot of germination and also a lot of weeds that we had to control. And then over time, we started um, getting a lot of beautiful established plants. So I recommend checking that out. Here's photos of some of the tours that, um, that we did this year at that site. Um, and the last component of growing native plants from seeds that I wanna cover are land stewardship techniques to establish native seeds on land in a more natural setting um, where you can seed into areas that were burned and prescribed fire or in just burn pile areas. Um, there's lots of projects on public and private land that have used these methods on larger scale, um, but you can also do it on a small scale. It doesn't have to be on a large scale. You can just use small plots. Um, so here's an example of just one small area where one little area um, was burned, just a small area, and then seeded into. Um, and over time, you can just you know keep doing small spots over um, you know over different areas on your property. Good opportunities for native seeding include into burn pile areas, like you see here. Um, burn piles, you know, create a nice um, open area. Uh, free of competition with good minerals that you can sow the seeds into. And it just really helps set um, the, a good stage at the beginning for the seedlings to get established. Um, you can grow a lot of native plants this way. Um, as native seedlings, they love to germinate and grow in the post-fire environment. Um, so you can see um, hound's tongue seedlings in the bottom left there, a bunch of little hound's tongue seedlings coming up in what was a burn pile area. Um, and then you can see the mature plants uh, later on in the photo on the bottom right. Um, so that's, you know, maybe five years later, um, all those hound's tongues blooming. You can see kind of the, still the shape of the, of the burn pile, the round area. Um, but over time, those, those plants that get established, they set seed, the seed spreads out of that circular area and it starts to have a more natural area, natural shape. Um, and in the top photo, you can see little bush, silver bush lupin, California lomatiums, native grasses germinating. <clears throat> um, this is a progression of a seeded area. Um, these were both burn pile areas that are now full of lomatiums and hound's tongues and balsam roots. You can also use a flame torch to clear an area of dried vegetation in the fall. Flame torches are great for doing weed control as well. Um, and you can burn off the area, you know, with, you know, using safe burning methods um, in the winter with a flame torch when, when conditions are, are good for doing this type of work um, and just burn off the, the thatch and then sow in, sow seeds into it. Um, this is the same spot in the fall and in uh, the spring. So you can see all those hound's tongues and, uh, you know, velvet lupins and native grasses. So here's some more up close photos of the same spot. Um, so you can see how burning and sowing definitely can help lead to, you know, really great native plant communities that over time, you know, it takes time um, to establish, um, but the results turn out really good in the long run. Okay, so here's some great resources to wrap up. I highly recommend Oregon Flora and Cal Flora which are the respective floras for each state that curate information about the state's vegetation, native and non-native. Um, I use both of these sites constantly um, and the Native Plant Society of Oregon site has good info and we have our local Siskiyou chapter down here in Southwest Oregon. Um, just getting to know native plants in their natural habitats is one of the best things you can do to better learn how to grow them too. Um, knowing how they grow in the wild helps you understand the conditions they need to thrive in landscapes and yards. Um, so there's there's nothing more important than learning about the plants in the wild to help you grow them for sure. So you can check out classes through Siskiyou Field Institute, Native Plant Society, um, the OSU Land Stewards, Master Naturalist Program, etc. Um, I recommend the Nursery Manual for Native Plants, which has lots of great information. One of the editors of this book was um, Tom Landis from Southern Oregon Monarch Advocates. 
Um, this is uh, specifically for tribal nurseries, but the information is good for anybody that wants to grow native plants. And you can download that PDF for free. Um, so nursery manual for native plants, a guide for tribal nurseries, got lots of great, good information. Um, there's lots of good information about native seed germination online, like different uh, protocols. Um, although sometimes you get conflicting information, which can be kind of challenging. You know, people get different results with different methods and, you know, it's always good to experiment. Um, I like this site, the Plant Propagation Protocols for Pacific Northwest Plants out of the University of Washington. Um, there's also the RNGR site that has a propagation protocol database um, the, uh, that's created through the Native Plant Network. And I think they're gonna, their goal is to keep adding propagation protocols for as many species as they can. Um, so over time, this site should have a lot more information than it currently does. Um, if you want some recommendations for great native pollinator plants to grow in Southern Oregon, you can download the booklet that Tom Landis and I put together, Native Pollinator Plants for Southern Oregon on my website, just under the drop down menu, what we do. And with that, I will end my presentation. Um, this is the website again, climacistuseeds.com. Um, and I am going to stop sharing my screen. Just a sec here. Okay. And then we can open it up for questions. Terrific, Susie. That was great. Wonderful. Lots of great information and good stories. Really, really enjoyed that and kind of just soothing just to see all those pictures. Yeah. So, so far we don't have a lot of questions in there, so I think we're going to be able to get through them. But um, right in the beginning, there was a question about what plant you were collecting from. I think it was a tall, I wasn't sure if it was bear grass. Yeah, the picture was me collecting bear grass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, okay. one of them anyway. I know there was a picture of me collecting bear grass. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, and bear um, grass is the species, I'll just point out since we're on the topic, that it doesn't bloom every year necessarily. It's kind of got erratic blooms. And so when it's in a good year, you got you to gotta go for it because you might not right. get it the next year. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, then there's a question. Is it easier to clean fleshy fruit seeds when they're when the flesh is moist or dry? Definitely moist. Um, yeah, if you let the fruit dry, um, you're going to have to probably reconstitute, you know, like imbibe it in water to get it to become moist again to to actually clean the seed. Um, sometimes, like I like I mentioned, like if you were to let an elderberry berry dry out, you could just sow the seeds with the fruit on with the fruit on it. But some some species the flesh can be prohibitive for germination. So sometimes you have to know those hints a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to clean dried berries. So it's definitely best when you, if you collect berries to just clean them right away as quick as you can. When berries are on for me, I stop everything else and I just do berries because otherwise you're gonna, they'll mold and things like that. I love that picture of all the little berries. That was beautiful. I screenshotted that one. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, okay, let's see here. So Christina says, Troon is definitely worth the trip. Um, Ada says, can one DIY a hydro seeding matrix? Um, a hydro seeding matrix, can you DIY it? I don't think so because you uh, the hydro seeding is pretty much done by uh, you know, like a large machine. I mean, you might be able to with some sort of personal sprayer type thing, but I, I've never heard of that. Um, the, the main reasons to hydro seed is if you have erosive soils, you know, so, you know, if you don't have erosive soils or you're not on a steep slope, there's really not much benefit to hydro seeding. Um, and if you do have steep, you know, and it's expensive too, that's the other thing. Um, but, but for, you know, for people that have slopes, you can also, um, use wattles or other things that kind of catch seed. Um, one method I've used is um, jute netting. Um, you can put jute netting down on a slope um, and then sow the seeds directly into the jute netting. So you don't, you, so you, you, you know, then the jute netting will kind of hold the seeds in place in the nooks and crannies of the netting and then it biodegrades over time. Um, so there's other methods to help, um, you know, I, I was a great experiment to do the hydro seeding. It worked really good, but as it's expensive and it's not necessarily for everybody. Um, so 
other methods to help with erosion can be good, more DIY, low budget uh, methods. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Michael says most seeds are easy to determine when they're ready to harvest, but what about polydiscus ocean spray? Is it too late now? Um, that's a good question. I mean, one one easy way to determine is if if this if the um, if the dried inflorescence with the with the um, you know that would contain the seed if it's dried out and you can put it in a plastic bag and break it up you might be able to see if the seed kind of sifts down to the bottom of the plastic bag. Um, Cause ocean spray can do that. If you just kind of break up the material, you can see all the seed kind of break up and float to the bottom of a plastic bag. You can visually see that. Um, so if you break it up and you don't see a lot of that seed, it might've already kind of dissipated and it's probably too late. Um, but sometimes you're surprised at, you know, some, you know, Seeds, seeds that kind of hold it, hold on for a while after a few storms, they're still there. So, you know, it's worth a try. Yeah, and I think that, like you were saying, how they'll germinate at different times. I think sometimes some of that is that they're actually not dropping all to the ground at the same time, and that's all part of their strategy to have a diversity of kind of weather and everything that they're encountering. So some of them are going to have good a good setup. Yeah, they hedge their bets and they used and one yeah. single plant can use different strategies um, to try to, you know, hit the right conditions. Right. Um, let's see, not a seed question, but I'm curious if you have tips on propagating elderberries from cuttings. Oh, from cuttings? Um, you know, I'm not an expert in elderberry cuttings necessarily. I mean, obviously rooting hormone, if you haven't experimented with that, would probably be something that you could experiment with. Um so I, I don't really have any specific tips on that, um, but rooting hormone. See, see the recording from last week's class with Jared. He okay. talked a lot about cuttings and some of that uh, could definitely apply to native plants as well. We'll be posting yeah. that on the YouTube after a bit. Um, yeah, a lot of techniques that you use for general um, nursery horticultural methods can be applied to natives just the same. Yeah, and one of the things that he said is that he doesn't use commercial um, hormones, but he just uses willow. Yeah. So he'll like chop up willow and use willow water, create, soak it in water, and then water with that after he does the cuttings. Absolutely. That's a great method too. Yeah. And, and you know, commercial nurseries do all kinds of things that people don't do on, you know, on a small backyard scale. You know, they might use gilberillic acid to get seeds to germinate. You know, there's lots of different um things that 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 you can use to trigger seed germination that you know as just a, a everyday person you may not do you know but it's good things to know about you know and it's good to know like like the willow cuttings for um creating rooting hormone hormone you know naturally that's that's a really good method too right 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 i've sometimes just put willow just cut willow branches into a water with stems of something and gotten them all you know and they all get rooting together yeah. And, you know, um, one of the things about like, like species like willow that are really easy to, to root, um, you know, you can literally just cut a willow stake and stick it in the ground. And a lot of times it give, if it has the right conditions, it'll, it'll just, uh, it'll just root right there on site, you know, but I, one thing to keep in mind is just kind of part of the conversation is that, you know, I know that the agencies, when they do large scale willow propagation, they will grow them from seed because if you just used all the same clone of one plant, you know, you're not going to have genetic diversity, you know, so sometimes, yeah. so, you know, and I, I grow some things right from, you know, rooting root roots and, you know, layering and tip layering and, you know, clonal too, but, uh, but it's just something to keep in mind, you know, genetic diversity is important. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of as a related topic, you showed those pictures of big growing outs of seeds. And now that there's, I went to the National Native Seed Conference and they were talking about how you don't want to do that too many generations because then you're, you're pushing on the genetic drift, adapting the plants for those conditions of those mass growing and the, whatever the harvesting mechanisms are and all that kind of stuff. So they want to always have this access to the native kind of um, seeds that are still growing in the wild. And so that's, that's one of the really cool things about people being interested in the small scale, because that ultimately, I feel like is really going to help maintain that diversity in our area. Exactly. I think that, you know, protocols for doing large scale grow outs like that is you have to renew the genetics like every three yep. years, you know, so right. yeah, and, and that's an important thing to do. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see. Doug says, what do you think of using parboiled rice hulls instead of perlite? Oh, I think we had that question last week too. <laughs> oh, geez, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I've never done that, but I don't see like for dra for drainage, you know, I, I mean, if, you know, it's worth experimenting with, you know, I think that um, anything to help limit, you know, the damage to the planet in our pursuit of growing native plants is a good thing. <laughs> so, you know, we have to keep that in mind that a lot of the things that we use, you know, can, you know, you know, especially amendments and things like that, they are mined from the earth that's maybe destroying a native habitat somewhere else. So, um, you know, I don't really have a great answer to that because I don't know specifically, but, you know, I think experimenting in that way is, is always good. Yeah. Okay, and then Judith Rose says, hard part for me has been transition from small starts in pots to planting out. Often by the time rainfalls come around, my starts are withered or invisible, and I'm afraid they are dead. How to keep them alive until October? Um, well, that's a good question. That is kind of, especially the drought, really drought tolerant native plants, they're, they're difficult to keep alive in pots. You know, we're taking a or, you know, it's like you're taking a species that that in the wild has all these different access to, you know, micronutrients and mycorrhizals and all, you know, all these different things in the ground and you're forcing it into growing into plastic. And, you know, it's just not a great environment for a lot of species like the, the species that have fibrous root systems and that are moist loving. They're the easiest to grow in the nursery. Um, you know, you're not going to get much rotting out for a species that likes it wet. Um, but for really drought tolerant plants, it can be really challenging. Um, and I kill lots of plants and, you know, <laughs> growing too. It's like, we, we all do it. It's hard. Um, so just creating the right soil mixes with good drainage and not overwatering. You're, you're going to kill more plants in the nursery overwatering by far than you are, you know, probably from underwatering. Um, so it's really easy to overwater. So having good soil drainage, not overwatering, you know, trying to keep the soil surface dry as long as possible to keep, um, to keep, you know, all the different um, molds and, and, you know, pathogens, you know, uh, limited in the nursery environment. Um, and then also, you know, in, in a pot, you will need to fertilize. Um, so you're going to have stronger, more robust plants if you give them some fertilizer, you know, um, and you can, do that through compost teas and things like that if you don't want to buy a commercial fertilizer, you know. Um, so there's ways to to help improve um, the the health of, of plants to get them through the summer. But um, I, I think the main thing is is um, having the appropriate size container for the root system, uh, making sure it's a deep pot if it's something that's tap rooted or that has you know a really deep root system, upsizing. You know, if you try to keep um, a plant that has a really big root system in a tiny pot, it, it's it's gonna it's gonna starve. Um, so you you have to kind of um, just grow, use the right containers and things like that. Um, but but it's challenging. You know, a lot of these really drought tolerant native plants, they they can be they're hard to grow. Um, things that are grow from um, you know root from bulbs and things like that, they're just really slow. Um, and as we all know, like even a milkweed can be kind of slow in a pot, but then once you get established in the ground, you know, it just spreads like crazy. So sometimes it's just getting that little seedling to make it, get it in the ground, and then, you know, it's going to do better. Yeah. And, um, what I've found too, I mean, I just do it on a really small scale, just total backyard experimentation, but at, like with the lomatiums, I make sure that I get them in, I sprout them in a deep, a pretty deep pot, like maybe a gallon pot or whatever. And I'll just let them grow over this summer, but on the edge of my yard where they get a little bit of irrigation and they just die back. They go to summer dormant and then they'll come back up in the spring. So you might, they might not be dead. They might just be down for the summer or uh, one of my friends, I think, calls it hot winter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a really good terminology. <laughs> I like that because that is something that a lot of people are, aren't um, very familiar with is the fact that a good portion of our low elevation habitat, the flora goes summer dormant. Yep. You know, it comes up, it goes gangbusters in the spring, it goes to seed, and then you're not going to see it again for months and months, you know. Um, and so a lot of people do assume that it died. Um, and that's true for direct seeding too. You know, a little tiny, like you're talking about lomatium, if you direct seed a little tiny lomatium, you know, it's going to get like an inch big the first year, grow for a couple months, and then boom, it's it's dormant, you know. It's so it's, And yeah. it's still growing. Right. It's still growing underground. Yeah. You just don't see yeah. that it's still growing. <laughs> 
So, you know, visually you may not realize it's still there and it's growing, but it is, it's just putting its roots down. Yeah. You know? So yeah, you have to be patient and you have to yeah. like and mark things, you know, mark where you put them because they may disappear yeah. and then reappear in the spring. So yeah. Right. Yeah. And getting out there and, and meeting them where they live and kind of getting used to what they do and being used to that too, is really helpful for that as well. Absolutely. Um, let's see. So what technique do you recommend for deep pluming circle carpus betuloides? For deep what? Deep. Deep pluming. I, I find that it just oh, kind of falls pluming. right out. You, you just oh, 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 ready. Yeah. Good yeah. gloves. Good gloves. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I honestly, I put mine in a seat cleaner, but you know, I've done it by hand plenty of times. And um, I think just as long as you have gloves on, because the, the plumes are, are spiny and they, it can be, they're very irritating. Um, so, you know, um, definitely have gloves on and you can just um, put them in, um, you know, a bucket and just really break them up with your hands with gloves. Um, and then just put them on um, in some sort of, um, you know, sieve of some kind and just kind of break them up with a glove and then you know a lot of that kind of chaff will just kind of break break through the screen um that's kind of the basic diy method i mean you can sit there and literally just pluck each one off um, but that's pretty tedious um that, that was for um mountain mahogany if people aren't familiar with that one it has that pretty spiral plume that it gets on the seed somebody said, please repeat the site for the uh, nursery manual for native plants. I don't know if you have the bandwidth to like drop a link or two in the chat. I was putting some of those down. I can look up some of those and send them in the, in the email that will have the link to your recording to later. Yeah. It's, it's um, the nursery manual for native plants for, um, for, uh, Oh, somebody did it. It looks like okay, somebody okay. put it in there. Thank okay. you. That's great. <laughs> Too slow. Okay. Yeah, that's a great start... that's a great book because you can just download <laughs> the whole PDF and it's got a lot of great information. And some of it might be more um, commercial sized, you know, application that you may not need, but it's still helpful hints, even if you're just using, you know, doing it in your backyard. Right. Um, if your seeds started germinating during stratification, is it okay to plant them outside? Is there something that should be done to prep the ground? I have germinating Brown's peony seed in the refrigerator and I'm agonizing over what to do with it. Oops. Well, that's kind of a good a good learning lesson is that you, you don't wanna artificially stratify them too early, you know, because if you, um, if you stratify them at a point where it, like if you put the seedlings outside and it's too cold, um, you know, they may not do well. Um, but I would just say if you have, if that's the situation you're in, I would experiment. I would try to um, put some in some nursery pots in a protected place and see what they do. I'd put some outside directly in the ground, see what they do. Um, you know, it, it's not an ideal situation because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of going against the the usual timing of, of germination for that species. Um, but you never know. I mean, it's a pretty cold hardy species, so it might do okay as a little germinant out over the winter. I, I, I don't really know because I have never encountered that exact scenario. But um, I, I always kind of say that in the instances like that, when, you know, you're not sure what to do, just take part of your seed and do, you know, one thing with it, take another part and do a different thing with it and just kind of see if something works. Yeah, it, it, if you have like a cool place that's protected from freezing, you might just like on a porch next to your house or something, put it out so it doesn't, so it can just think it's a really long cold spring or something. Yeah, and and you never know, maybe it'll. I know it, it maybe it'll. Cold, right? Maybe it'll right. work. You never know. You know, okay, you never know yeah. with, with seeds sometimes. But yeah, I mean, that's that's the trick with doing artificial um, cold moist stratification is that if you. You have to get the timing right so that when you're when your germinates are actually ready to sow, you actually have the right conditions. And and if you have a warm greenhouse, you know, then you could emulate a spring. Um, but if you don't, and you know, then then you you run the risk of planting the seeds out too early. Um, so so that's why sometimes it's easiest, you know, or if you live in an area like Southwest yeah. Oregon, you know, interior Southwest Oregon, you can just sow outside in the fall and then the seeds will germinate in the spring when they're ready, you know, um, or they'll wait another, another year. You never know. They might do that too. Right. Right. Okay. I, and then um, Barbara has an answer for rice hulls or 
at least one answer. She says, rice hulls, in my experience, can be powerful growth suppressants. Curious about using them for planting seeds if parboiled. Ah, okay. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, I use rice hulls for, um, you know, for just actual mulch in like veggie gardens oh. and stuff. So that makes sense that it can suppress growth on in a thick amount. You know, I just don't really know what par, what parboiling them would do, um, you know, yeah. but it's always interesting to try. And and one thing too, like when you direct sow native seeds, um, you know, if you have soil that's slightly erosive, like a really light layer of rice holes or um, organic rice straw, you know, that's weed free, you know, is also like a method that you can just put on very, very, very lightly, just kind of hold the seeds in place. You need, you want to leave um, room for light and, and, you know, exposure to, you know, sun conditions and everything, but um, a very light layer of rice holes or rice straw can kind of help hold the seeds in place too. Yeah. And, and hide them from birds. That's what I found when I tried to drag seed outside. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, turkeys and deer and all that can be challenging, yeah. to, you know, for yeah. small seed, for small areas that are direct seeded, you know, if it's not too cumbersome, it's always good to have some sort of temporary fencing to help things get established. That's not always you know, possible in certain sites, but, you know, if you can at least just have a temporary fence for a small area, just to prevent turkeys from going in there, and digging around, you know, like it can be helpful. Once, once the native plants are established, they can tolerate that, you know, but just the little seedlings are really vulnerable. Right. Okay. Um, let's see if, oh, wait a second. I lost my place here. Power... Oh, I, oh, we got to the end. Okay. We got to the end. Great. All okay. right. Um, well, uh, you know, I was just going to reiterate what you were saying about experimenting. And the other thing is, it's kind of like a long journey. It's really a different model than going to the nursery and getting a bunch of kind of four inch pots and putting them out and then having a big showy display of flowers, you know, that summer. And it's delightful kind of getting that rhythm and it's like a long-term investment you know these plants some of these plants who knows how long they live I know there's there's a bank where there's some erosion happening where there's some balsam root and the roots that are coming down are like you know as big as my forearm and like trees under the ground where they're being exposed by the erosion and those plants are really set up for our dry summers and you know when people say well should I plant natives or plant other things I'm like our natives have a lot going for them with whatever's going on here with the climate definitely keep planting the natives yeah there <laughs> is such a thing as an old growth wildflower for sure yeah, and yeah, they, they can live for decades and decades some of them so yeah. you know some are really short-lived you know and they right. they kind of you know like silver lupin only lives for you know a handful of years and then it you know said seed out and it propagates itself, you know, but, um, but a lot of them, they, like you said, like they're old, they're, they're slow growing, but once they're established, they're there and they're tough and they're resilient. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, and it is, I always liken it to growing an orchard. You're not going to get necessarily results, you know, right away. You gotta, you gotta give it some years yeah. for it to, right. you know, yeah. to, to be showy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, which is lovely. And I mean, if you think of Native Americans and that kind of concept of tending a landscape, you know, that you live within, like, that's what it's like. Yeah, so yeah. wonderful. So thanks for all that you do, Susie. Really appreciate you as a resource and for sharing with us and everybody here. We will probably tomorrow I'll process the video and get that uh, email out to you all. And I'll try to track down some of these resources for you as well. All right. All thanks right. a lot. I appreciate the Land Steward Program. Thanks to everybody. Okay. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Oops, I forgot the poll. I'll launch it in case anybody wants to hang around for it here. There we go. And just leave it up for a minute. Just three quick questions. And Susie, up to you. Yep. So if you're still around, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Giving you folks a couple of minutes here. I 
Okay. Thank you. Have a good evening.